What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of Keeping Up with the Commanders. We've got another jam-packed episode this week. We've got my quarterback rankings for the NFL Draft, which is now, what, today is April 7th or April 8th when this episode comes out, and the draft is April 25th. We are, quick math here, 17 days away, 17 days away from the first night, from finding out, really, who the franchise quarterback for the Washington Commanders will be or who hopefully the franchise quarterback of the Washington Commanders will be for the next few years, who will Adam Peters decide to pick with the second overall pick. We've got a lot of stuff. Again, like I mentioned, we've got the quarterback rankings. Then after that, I'm going to be going over who do I want in Washington, Drake May or Jane Daniels. The breakdown will happen in this episode. Then we've got a current big board just kind of checking into what my big board looks like right now. It's not, again, fully finalized yet, as I do have some top prospects still that I need to get to, but we're going to be going over the top 10 that I have there. And then we're going to be looking over your guys' mock drafts at where you guys submitted um, or commented under my stuff on my Twitter, at Mason underscore Kenahan, where you guys can pretty much send me your guys' mock drafts. And, of course, I'll look at them uh, in in each week's episode leading up to the draft. We've only got a few left, so make sure to get your guys' mock drafts in. And then at the end, we're going to be going over once more the plan moving into the last few weeks before the draft or last few episodes before the draft and kind of giving like an overview of what each episode will be about heading into the draft and during draft week as well, because that, of course, will have multiple podcast episodes for that week. Let's jump right into it then. My 2024 NFL draft quarterback rankings. I'm going to give you my top five. I'm going to give you an honorable mention. We'll, we'll start with an honorable mention to kick things off. Because, again, top five isn't really that much. But an honorable mention um, will be Spencer Rattler. So I have Spencer Rattler as my QB6 in this class. I think he definitely has a higher ceiling compared to some of the other guys I have kind of in the same tier as him, like the Penixes. I have Rattler, I will say, above Penix. So it's going. He's, I, yeah, I think he has a higher ceiling than guys like Penix. He has, I mean... The, there's been some concerns in the past about character issues, yada, yada, this, whatever. I really feel like that's in his past now. As Again, he was on that one show. I don't know if it was Netflix or some other. I forgot exactly what it was called, but he was on that one show that highlighted a few high school recruits in their process as getting offers and whatever, and it didn't really present a great image of Rattler in that one. But uh, still... Rattler, uh, if you don't know that much about him, he spent, I believe, three years, yeah, three years at Oklahoma, lost the job at Oklahoma to Caleb Williams, then goes ahead, transfers to Shane Beamer and the South Carolina Gamecocks. He spent the last two years in South Carolina as a starting quarterback there for the last two years. Uh, was able to watch his film this week and again stands at six foot, two hundred eleven pounds. He's twenty three years old. I, I liked a lot of what I saw from Radler. I think he definitely has some of the arm talent. He can't make some of the big-time deep throws, 50-plus yards downfield. But he has a great touch, in my opinion, with some of his throws, especially towards the sideline. Some some like um, outside, uh, out, outside breaking routes, I think he throws really well. He can deliver quick strikes on slants and ends. He can put some velocity on the football. Uh, I like his game a lot. Um, I So I don't think he's right now a, a starting quarterback in the league. I think he definitely has some development still to get to within his game, which, I mean, you know, he's he spent five years at school, but I still think he's a pretty raw prospect, I would say. And if you're a team, maybe in the second round, third round, I forgot exactly. I gave a late second round grade on Spencer Rattler. So I, like, if you're in the second round, I would say pretty much, I wouldn't really spend an early second round pick. I feel like there's some better guys that you can get early second round. But if you're middle of the second round and you kind of need a quarterback or late second round for sure, I think would be great value. Um, Rather would be a guy I would pick, especially over a guy like Michael Penix, an older player who has a lot of injury concerns or a pretty bad injury history. But Beyond that, um, yeah, Radler. Radler would be my honorable mention. At number five, I have Bo Nix. Bo Nix, um, one of the one of the I would say most known college football players. I wouldn't say he's like one of the greatest college football players in the last few years, but definitely one of the most known. Bo Nix starting sixty-one games at quarterback ever since his freshman season at Auburn. 
another one of those players where he transferred from our Ar- from Auburn to Oregon, uh, spent his last what was it last year I believe at Oregon I want to say, um, or maybe last two last two years I want to say potentially at Oregon I can't remember the exact but at six two two hundred sixteen pounds I gave a early second round grade on Bo Nix. Um, I think Nix, he does, I mean, I've talked about a little bit already on past episodes from a while ago, but Nix does all of the little things really well. Uh, I think he he can hit screens, the flats, the curls, all the, the other short routes, the um, to, a short to intermediate route uh, routes are kind of his thing is where he kind of thrives in the quick game. He gets the ball out really quick, probably the quickest out of any of these top quarterbacks, I would say. Um, he works really well in structure and what Oregon had with their offense last year. I think he does a great job with pre-snap reads, reading the defense, uh, kind of shifting the protection as well based on where the heat is going to be coming from off the snap. I think moving defenders off um, off his like off of routes with his eyes is something that he thrives in. And it really shows you the experience that he has at quarterback. Again, once more, starting 61 games, the most, the most ever for a college quarterback. It's just crazy. Again, that also makes him on the older side. He's going to be 24, or maybe he's already 24 when draft time uh, rolls around. And, over, oh, okay, so Nix, he doesn't really have the strongest arm in terms of arm talent-wise, but, again, he's consistent. And he doesn't really make the high-risk throws that are a big play, but also a big risk, I would say. I think Nix is more of a conservative uh, quarterback in terms of his decision making, he will make the short stuff. He's not going to. He's not going to. You're for, first and ten. He's not going to take a sack. He's not going to make it second and fifteen for you. He's going to make it second and eight, second and seven. That's what he's going to do. Which again isn't like a first down on a first and ten, or isn't going to take a big chunk of that yardage and make it the second down really easy. But he's not going to hurt you to the fact where it's going to be second and 17 because he took a bad sack or second and 18 because he took a bad sack. He's not going to take these bad sacks. I think he's pretty calm. He's pretty composed in the pocket once more because of how experienced he was in college and how much coaching development he's already has uh, with at Auburn and then at Oregon as well in Eugene. So um, you can really tell he's been developed over these five years in college. He never really seems phased, and I definitely think is a great prospect for an older guy, and that's why I have him above a player like Michael Penix. So you could say Penix definitely has the better arm, but Bonix's composure, his ability to not take bad sacks, Penix took a lot of bad sacks last year, is something that really put him over the top over guys like uh, Penix. And then, of course, Nix, in my opinion, is a more developed prospect right now than Spencer Radler. So, Bonix, my QB four in this class. Oh, sorry, QB five in this class. At number four, this might this one might um might uh be a little little controversy, but at number four, it's the Michigan man himself, the winner, the the winner of the I can't even find what I put my scouting report from right. The winner, uh, the national championship, <laughs> as um the winner of the national championship, as a lot of people and a lot of scouts are saying. They really like him because he's he's a winner. He, he wins games, and you can make the argument that court, uh, wins aren't a quarterback stat, and I agree, but it's just funny how that agenda has kind of become a thing for J.J. McCarthy. So J.J. McCarthy is my QB4. Um, I think McCarthy definitely has the ceiling of being a franchise quarterback in the league. I don't think he'll ever be a top eight, top nine, probably not a top ten quarterback, but I think he has the ceiling of being a top ten to fifteen quarterback in the NFL. And, I mean, that's a competent franchise quarterback, in my opinion. Look at a guy like Kirk Cousins. Cousins was, isn't, wasn't as never really been considered a top 10 or top 9, top 8. Maybe you can sneak him into the top 10 quarterback in the NFL at any point, in, really, in his career. But he's been a competent franchise quarterback, and he ends up getting over $180 million from the Atlanta Falcons this offseason. So McCarthy, I think, is um, – is someone that I think will need work, but also it has the ceiling. Again, we talked about Rattler, who has a higher ceiling too. I think McCarthy's ceiling is definitely a franchise quarterback in the league. I think, um, I mean, I, I watched a few games of him, and look, the arm is there. I like what I saw out of McCarthy's arm. I know the combine didn't really 
give the justice of his arm that I think really it deserves. He's very accurate, especially on the run, throwing it, throwing to his right. Very accurate quarterback. His decision-making sometimes is a little bit wonky, I would say, but also that will come with more development in the NFL. He's only 21 years old. He's one of the youngest, if not, I believe he is the youngest uh, quarterback prospect in, in this draft class. So it kind of gives you a few years if you want to, if you're a guy like Sean Payton and if you really want to start Jared Stidham over J.J. McCarthy, you can have McCarthy on the bench for, for a year or so and kind of develop him like, what the Chiefs did with Patrick Mahomes. So um, I think uh, I, I really like Westhoff McCarthy, um, the quick game he's solid in. Uh, and then also I think kind of working Michigan's offense was, what, was something that he was really good in. His mobility, I think he's sneaky athletic. Uh, I think he can break away from tackles. He, he's kind of fast. I wouldn't say he's, again, the fastest quarterback in the world, but I will say he's definitely pretty fast uh, in open space and can definitely make defenders miss. Um, uh, what else? Uh, yes, yeah, so some poor decision making. Uh, great accuracy on throws down the seam, I think, was something that really he thrived in during the Michigan State game. The Michigan State game, I was really impressed with, I'm pretty sure. And, um, yeah, he doesn't really take kind of similar to Bo Nix. I didn't really see him take a lot of high risk throws, but throws he did uh, take, he, he was threading the needle and stuff, making multiple NFL level throws and fitting passes into very tight windows, which is something I really liked out of his game. So JJ McCarthy is my QB four in this class. Now moving on to QB three. Is it May? Is it Daniels? Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but I'm just going to go straight to my QB one actually, because we'll get to the main Daniel stuff in the next segment, but going straight to QB one, I think is without a doubt, Caleb Williams. Um, I, I really don't see, why you can have anyone else have Williams kind of on his own tier right now above both Drake May and Jane Daniels. So Williams, um, I think, okay, my first impression, like the stuff that he can do just on, like when you're watching uh, just on TV, like casually watching some stuff that he does looks very stupid. It, it looks like what, what are you doing throws? Like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And he throws a pick or whatever. But some of the stuff that he does is just out of this world. Like he, his ability to create out of structure, I know you've probably heard it a million times, but he, Caleb Williams' ability to create out of structure is something very special, in my opinion, that I haven't seen a quarterback be able to do. I, I mean, I haven't been scouting prospects for a very long time, but from like since 2021, I would say 2020, since when I first started, I haven't really seen a quarterback be able to do what he can do out of structure. Uh, I think also some of the things when he is rolling out, when he's scrambling and stuff, eyes are always downfield, which you love to see. He's always looking for the receiver, uh, for the receivers to make a move. His receiver is very friendly for him and kind of noticed when he was scrambling out of the pocket and stuff and kind of adjusted their routes for him. Also something that I think was very, kind of was very under the radar, I would say, but when he is rolling out of the pocket, he's holding onto the ball with two hands. I have, football but he's he's a whole he's only on the ball for two with two hands which is which is awesome it's awesome because you look at some of these other quarterbacks who may scramble out and whatever do a lot of stuff outside structure they kind of roll around they kind of have their head a hand with the ball cut down a little bit and they're kind of scrambling a little bit and it's easily it the ball is easily able to be knocked out of their hand when they're only holding it with one especially if they're scrambling they kind of it, it's kind of crazy and stuff was happening in the backfield but he's always holding on with two hands he's looking downfield which is great um always looking to make uh, a big play out of something that might have been busted so um i i liked i loved what i saw out of caleb williams he's my clear qb1 some of the stuff in structure of course can be like there's a, definitely some stuff in structure you can work on but like just because of how much he can do out of structure what he can do with his mobility with his legs Without his arm strength, he can still throw at 60 yards downfield from pretty much all different kinds of, of arm positions or throwing positions as well. He doesn't have to be, I think people forget about this, he doesn't have to be a great or an elite quarterback in structure. He just has to be a good quarterback in structure. doesn't have to be a great one. 
because of what he can do outside of structure. That's what makes him special is what he can do outside of structure, what he can do when a play breaks down. So when a play breaks down in structure, I mean, if you can find a receiver, great. If you can do that at a, like, at a non, uh, as like a non-liability or whatever, like at a consistent pace, just finding open wide receivers in structure um, doesn't always go straight to the scramble drill or whatever. I think that's great, but he also doesn't have to be elite as an in structure quarterback because of what he can do out of structure balances out his weaknesses in structure. So that's what that's my thoughts on Caleb Williams. He's my clear QB one in this draft. Um, I'll get to the big board in a little bit, but now the time that many Commanders fans have been hoping for or have been waiting for. Drake May, Jaden Daniels, which quarterback do I have rated higher? And the answer to that, as my QB2, is Drake May. And here's why. Drake May, and what he can do that I think Jane Daniels can't do, is what Drake May can do with his arm. I think he's got he's definitely has a more talented arm, in my opinion, than Jane Daniels. Um, he can do the, the stuff the out of structure stuff I was just telling you about with Caleb Williams. He can't do it to the extent of what Caleb Williams can do, but he can also save broken down plays um i th i think that Dan uh, that may isn't like an incredible quarterback prospect in my opinion i think i would still take him with the second overall pick for sure but he's he's not really as developed as you would want a quarterback prospect to be there's still a lot of room to go uh for drake may so <clears throat> hold on yeah so um there's still, there's still room to go, but Drake May, his arm talent, he can make any throw on the field. Uh, he has some crazy zip, crazy velocity on his throws. That was something that I think lacks with Jay and Daniels and sometimes that his passes can be easily intercepted just because of the lack of velocity on some of his throws, especially across the middle of the field. So um, that was something that also separated Drake May from me, from Jay and Daniels. Uh, May definitely takes a lot of sacks sometimes, um, but also... He's also a bigger guy. He's six foot four. He's two hundred thirty pounds. Jane Daniels, 200, uh, 210 pounds, I believe, somewhere around that. So Drake May is kind of a harder guy to bring down, um, just from watching the tape. And you look at Jane Daniels' sack to pressure ratio, and it's one of the highest you've ever like from a quarterback prospect in the last few years. And if you just look at that one stat from the quarterback prospects of the last few years that panned out, and those that haven't, having a high sack to pressure ratio is a good like a, a good stat to look at when you're trying to see if quarterbacks will succeed or not because many quarterbacks that have had a high sack to pressure ratio haven't been able to pan out in the league and God, justin justin fields so it's it's kind of uh uh no i wouldn't say the only indication you should look at but a very notable indication uh, people should look at when looking at um, if a quarterback prospect will pan out. Definitely their sack to pressure ratio. Jane Daniels, one of the highest I've seen in a while. So that's that's also something. Um, Drake May, I think, as a runner, is definitely a little bit uh, underlooked, I would say, or overlooked, I would say. So uh, that that's something that I think May excels at a lot. Um, his pocket presence definitely can be a little bit better. But overall, I think I know the accuracy issues are somewhat there, but the throws that I have seen him make kind of balance that out. And if he can just start hitting the consistent stuff underneath in the intermediate and whatever, he's got he's got some of the tougher throws and in the into the NFL window throws. He can make those. Just make sure to be consistent on the easier throws for Drake May. So that's why I have him over Jane Daniels. Some more kind of stuff about Jane Daniels because I didn't really talk about him a lot. Uh, we'll start off with the good, because I know I've, I've said some bad stuff about Jane Daniels already, but some good stuff that I liked from Jane Daniels. He's got a fluid, quick throwing motion. He gets it out there quick. Um, I, he ran a lot of stuff uh, in shock, and I would say that's also something that I would notice. Drake May, in that UMC offense, ran a good majority, uh, not a lot, but also ran stuff under center. Jane Daniels did not run anything under center. When you're in the NFL, you're going to be running stuff under center. You got to know, I mean, it's a small thing, but you got to know how to take a snap under center from a center. If That's a lot of center stuff. But when you're under center, you got to learn how to take a snap. You got to learn how to drop back on the five, seven steps drops instead of just like 
Jane Daniels, who took a, just a lot of one to three step drops uh, for him. So in, in the scheme that LSU ran. So uh, that's also something to look at. Um, for Daniels, it was kind of at times lazy, slow foot footwork. Daniels, again, he can, he's got a beautiful deep ball. He can uh, launch it downfield. I will say his having Malik neighbors and Brian, and Brian Thomas and Lacey as well. Helped him out a good a, a lot. Helped him out um, and made him look good. So having a few of the best wide receivers in the country definitely helps. You look at Caleb Williams' uh, skill positions and his weapons, and you look at Drake May's weapons. Nowhere even near as close to how good Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas are. So uh, that's also something um, for Daniels. His eyes downfield when scrambling on the pocket. He's got an electric acceleration, especially when uh, running out of the pocket and uh, as well. I think Daniels, his pocket awareness was, uh, pocket presence was decent, I would say. I think it, it was it's pretty good, but sometimes just likes to um, run into pressure at times. So it, it, was, it was a little bit inconsistent, but mostly good for Daniels. Um, he could make throws from a tight pocket as well. Uh, I will say Daniels, he can stare down the big play for too long. I'm, I'm just looking through my notes. So he stares, stares down the big play for too long. And that, that definitely on his progressions, I think, uh, it, it doesn't always, it's not always the big play either. It's kind of just the first, the first read. Uh, he can, he can stare down too long and that forces him to be under pressure before he can get through the entire, uh, progression and he'll miss an open receiver. That that's why he misses the open receivers. He can't get through the entire progression then you'll have to roll out and make a play, which he can make a play. Like I mentioned, the electric speed and the electric acceleration that he has, pretty much that entire offense had. But when he's running, for some reason, he doesn't know how to slide. He doesn't know how to slide. And that that gives me flashbacks of 2012 RG3. So that's what worries me a little bit as well. But he will definitely need to know how to slide because you cannot be getting hit from Fred Warner or from linebackers like that in the NFL, because that's going to hurt. So we'll make it Fitzpatrick or those guys, because that's going to hurt. So he's got to learn how to slide because he took some video game like hits uh, that looked very painful. Just watching them, it looked very painful. It felt painful just watching them. So Daniels, that's my thoughts on him uh, and kind of where I'm at right now with May Daniels. I have a mid first round grade on Drake May and a mid to late first round grade on Jane Daniels. So that's where, and then for Williams, I have an early first on Williams. So I'm not as high on Drake May as some people are. And I'm, I feel like I'm around consensus with Jane Daniels. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I think both May and Daniels can be franchise quarterbacks in the NFL. I'd rather take May for ceiling and also for his, um, yeah, pretty much for his ceiling. I just feel like he has the higher ceiling than Jane Daniels. And even though, even though it couldn't, it doesn't hit. Uh, there's a chance that he doesn't hit, and we'll be looking for a new GM and a head coach in three, four years. There's also a chance that we hit a home run with him. So that's kind of my thoughts on where I'm at with that, and kind of overall now looking at my big board where I stand. Uh, at number one, Marvin Harrison Jr. Number two, Caleb Williams. I have um, I've given them the same grade early, very early, like top three picks or whatever, whatever you want to say. But very, very early first round grades. Um, and then like to lot to the edge rusher from UCLA is my third overall player at seven point seven, which is like a still an early first round seven point seven, the same grade to Olu Fashanu, the left tackle out of Penn State. I have not done, again, I'm going through my top 10 here. One major name I haven't done is Joe Alt. I'll be doing Joe Alt this week. Uh, I'm, I'm still waiting for film, but I'm hopefully getting film this week on him. I'm going to be doing some of the other top guys as well. So far, I'm through over 50 prospects. So these are, I've done pretty much all the big names except Olu for, uh, except Joe Alt and except, except Joe Alt, Talise Fuwaga, and Brock Bowers are kind of the three that I still, three big ones that I still need to do. So, Olu Fashanu right now at number four. Nate Wiggins, kind of a step down at number five. Malik Neighbors at six. Romo Dunze right after him at seven. Drake May at eight. Jackson Powers Johnson at nine. And Terry on Arnold at ten. 
So that's my top 10 right now. I expect that to change. I expect Joe Alt to be in that top 10. Uh, Fulaga, we'll see if he's going to be able to sneak into that top 10. I'm not entirely sure of that. And I expect Brock Bowers to be probably on the bottom half of that top 10. We'll see if he makes it in as well. But right now, Harrison at one, Williams at two, Lot two at three, Fashano at four, Wiggins at five, Neighbors at six, Odunze at seven, Drake Mann number eight, Jackson Power Johnson number nine, and Terry on Arnold at number 10. Right after him, just going through the list, Johnny Newton, Jaden Daniels, Brian Thomas, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Byron Murphy, J.J. McCarthy, J.C. Latham, Keon Coleman, and Troy Faltenu. Those are the guys I've given a first-round grade on uh, of the list so far. Fatanu is more of a – I'm so he's a borderline first, I would say. But I've given him a first-round grade on – technically right now on 19 different prospects. I expect three, four more, I would say, to give a first-round grade on, that being Bowers, Alt, Fuaga, um, and I'm probably forgetting someone as well. Maybe Nubin. I don't think I'm going to give a first-round grade to Nubin, but – I think those are the three I'm missing right now. So, yeah, I think that's probably the, th- the three. That's the three. So, those are the guys um, as my first round. I'm going to have a full big board, of course, as we get closer to the draft. I'm going to release on my Twitter, and then we'll have a pod talking about it as well, my top 50 for this year. So, that's kind of where I'm at right now with my big board. I want to move on now to the mock drafts that you guys have sent me. Um Again, you can send me either DM me on Twitter or I kind of post every now and then the drop your mock drafts. Just, just comment on any of my posts, really, and I'll go over them. We'll start with Mayflower, and it's Drake May, Mayflower. Drake May at number two, Jordan Morgan and Tyler Newbin with the second round picks. Cam Hart with the third round pick. Jonah Ellis uh, with the other third round pick. Roger Rosengarten with the fourth. Johnny Wilson and Dylan Holker with the fifth round picks. And Ryan Florney. Flournoy with the seventh round pick. Um, breaking this down real fast, Drake May, again, would be my selection. Jordan Morgan and Tyler Newbin would be solid. I think I would not be trading up for Tyler Newbin, and I don't think I'd be selecting Tyler Newbin with that first second round pick. That second second round pick would be I'd be fine with. I think there could be still better options. I'm usually not in love with the safety class really at all, and I feel like we're kind of set right now. With I'm, I'm kind of happy with where we're at at safety with – uh, Derek Forrest and Quan Martin and um, Jeremy Chin, who I think will be playing more linebacker, but still, I'm kind of I'm happy where we're at with safety right now. Cam Hart, I've, I've talked about him a lot. I talked to him on last week's pod. He was in my he was in my mock draft. Um, I pretty much talk, you can just go watch that one. I I love the guy. Jonah Ellis, I think, is a very underrated pass rusher. I think I would probably if we select him with that second second overall pick, uh, second second round pick, I would not be mad at that. Roger Rosengarten has been a guy that has gone up. His, his stock kind of hit a ceiling and has kind of fallen off a little bit recently, I would say. He plays right tackle for Washington. Johnny Wilson would be an interesting selection with what he could do potentially at tight end, especially with the need at tight end. There's not a tight end, I don't believe. Don't, don't, uh, yeah, I don't believe there was a – well, isn't – oh, yeah, Holker's a tight end. So that's what I thought, but – uh, yeah, so Wilson, it'd be interesting to see. You got, you got Holker anyways, but, um, yeah, out of Colorado State. But uh, Wilson, it'll be interesting to see. I, I don't think Washington will be eyeing Johnny Wilson unless it'd be to shift him to tight end and we don't draft a tight end, which he does not want to do. So Wilson, I'm not entirely in love with that pick. Dallin uh, Holker, I need to learn more about. And then Flournoy, I, I got to see at the Senior Bowl, and he was very impressive at the Senior Bowl. I don't think he's making it to the seventh round. So that'd be awesome if he does, but I, I just, I don't see him making it. So that'd be a great pick though. So overall, uh, I like the May Morgan pick. Newman pick was okay. I like the Hart Ellis picks. Rosengarten was okay. I feel like I'd probably go uh, tackle again a little bit earlier and then maybe edge rusher kind of flip the Ellis and Rosengarten picks, go edge rusher for a uh, go tackle first or another offensive lineman first and then edge rusher wilson pick i didn't like at all holker is fine and flournoy i loved so overall i'd give this one maybe like a c plus b minus somewhere around there mayflower um good job that, that's solid that's all it's a passing grade it's a passing grade you you take that so that i that's why you that one we're, we're, i mean this this pod's running pretty long we gotta we gotta keep on going here but mark Lanton. Uh, with the second with the second mock here, 
Drake May in the first round, Newbin and Morgan. So the same two picks in the second round just kind of flip-flop. So Newbin would be at 36 and Morgan would be at 40. Then we trade up 14 picks later, pick 54. With the Cleveland Browns, we give them the pick 67 and a fifth round pick to move up 13 spots in the draft. And we select Ricky Pearsall. You got me there. That's an A-plus pick. I love Ricky Pearsall. I, I talked about him so much. Uh, you might call me a biased Florida, biased Florida fan, but I love Ricky Pearsall. He's, I'm going to have my wide receiver rankings next week. You're going to see how much I love Ricky Pearsall in that wide receiver ranking. So um, that I'm, I'm going to get into that next week with, uh, I believe, with William Herman, who's going to be coming on. So that'll be awesome. And then round three, pick 78, Cam Hart. Round three, pick 100, Jaheim Bell, the tight end out of Florida State. Jalen Ford, the linebacker out of Texas in the fifth round. And then, uh, hold on, I think, yeah, okay. And then Jaden Crumedy, the defensive tackle out of Mississippi State in the seventh round. If this happens, I mean, we get Pure Soul, we get May, we get Morgan. I don't know, really know what we're doing in the offensive line. I feel like the Jaheim Bell pick could be maybe an offensive lineman or that, and then maybe take a tight end late maybe day seven uh, round seven maybe trade up into the sixth round for a tight end and give up like a seventh or a sixth next year for him but i think there's some that kind of last cluster of tight ends on in day four or day three it's kind of, i kind of have all of them in the same pack but um jalen four is an interesting pick linebacker out of texas uh i haven't really seen that one a ton but i'd give this one like a b i think it's solid or i would give it a b plus I'd, I'd give it a B plus. I feel like some of these picks, especially the later ones, could be better. Um, I I love moving back up. If it only takes a fifth round pick to move up from sixty seven to fifty four in the draft, I would I would take it. I would do it because I I love that. So I'm not entirely sure if Cleveland would do that. I think maybe it would take a fourth. I would say maybe to move that move up. And we don't really have a fourth. We have the pick one hundred, the third. But I I love that. The Morgan pick I like, um, May, of course, Cam Hart pick I like, Jalen Ford is an interesting one. Uh, defensive tackle, I don't really feel like we need a defensive tackle right now, especially with Phil Mathis coming back. People kind of forget about him, the 2022 second round pick. Uh, we're going to see what he can do. So, um, I, I I mean, it's, it hasn't looked great for Mathis so far, but hopefully he can maybe do something in the run. So i give this one a B, B plus. So good job there. Um Hmm. Uh, going through here. Uh, um, we'll go with Coles next. Jane Daniels at two. Michael Penix at 36. Radler at 40. Jordan Travis at 67. Joe Milton at 78. And Tulia Tungavaloa at 100. I, I I mean, I told him, like, if this is the move, quarterback all, all six picks or whatever, or trade up, trade up and just get as many quarterbacks as you can. Um, I mean, I'd do it. I, I mean, I guess so. You got to hit out one of them at some point. You got to hit out one of them. So, uh, that'd be something I, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, going through here, gold mine, gold mine here. Jane Daniels at two, AD Mitchell at 36. I could definitely see him falling potentially. That'd be actually, I don't think I could see him falling. I, I just don't, I don't think now that I think about it with all those teams that need a wide receiver, um, especially the Bills now after trading away digs. So I don't think he's going to be there at 36. Patrick Paul at 40. Peyton Wilson at 67. Ben Sinnott at 78 has been a guy that a lot of Washington fans have kind of got, like, started. I know I know Josh Taylor has kind of been, like, the main guy who's kind of praised Ben Sinnott and been, like, the Ben Sinnott uh, fan club over there and been kind of the leader of that. But him at 78. Bucky Irving at 108. Curtis Jacobs at 139. Zach Sinter at 152. Jalix Hunt at 157. I love that pick. Jaquan Shepard at 222 as well i mean it looks like what you trade back a little bit for a was this a fifth round pick or i would say maybe so trade back eight spots in the third round for a fifth or a sixth round pick a high sixth round pick i would say maybe or maybe this is a low fifth i think this is a low fifth i would say maybe potentially at 157 i'm trying to do some math here but I don't know if we would get a fifth round pick just moving back eight spots in the third, end of the third round into the fourth round. I don't think you get a fifth, but I love this one. Uh, Jay and Daniels, AD Mitchell. If we get him, I'm I'm getting I'm gonna race up there and grab him myself. And then Zach Zinter, I've talked about him. Sounds like he's going to be ready 
for the start of the season, which is awesome. I talked about him potentially being like an Andrew Voorhees type progression for him coming off of a torn, a torn broken fibula and tibula or whatever. But uh, I mean, I love the Zach Zinter pick Benson as well um, at tight end. Definitely could see him going on in round three. Peyton Wilson is one of the best linebackers in this class. Uh, Patrick Paul, you pair him up with with his brother in Washington, Chris. Bucky Irving, I've talked about uh, how much I've liked him. The testing has not gone in my favor there for Bucky Irving, but he's one of my favorite running back running backs in this class. And then Jalix Hunt, I think, is going to be at the edge rush out of Houston, uh, Houston Christian. I think he's going to be probably in the fifth or sixth round. Uh, sorry, fourth or fifth round. I think he goes higher than many people expect because I think some NFL teams fall in love with him. Overall, I love this one. And if A.D. Mitchell really does fall, I'd give this one an A. I'd give this one an A. I really would because, I mean, I don't really know what else maybe – yeah, I don't really know what else to kind of say. Um, I'd give this an A. I'd give this an A. Uh, great job, Goldmine PRD. So uh, that's the highest grade I've give, given a mock draft, I believe, so far. So – that's the last one we're going over. Um, now, kind of wrapping things up, what's next for the pod? Next week, I already mentioned it, but we're going to be going over wide receivers, my top 10 wide receivers in this draft class, plus the honorable mention, of course. And I'm going to be joined by William Herman for that episode as well. We're going to be going back and forth, giving each, both of our top 10 wide receivers in this class. I'm excited for that one. Uh, and then... And we'll also be going over if any commander's news breaks or whatever during this week. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. And then the week after that will be the NFL draft one and well, not with well, the NFL mock draft that I do every week as well. So uh, that or not every week, every year, I can't talk now every year, every year. I, I, I do that annually the Monday before the draft. I give my full first round mock draft that'll be coming out in two weeks time. And then, of course, I haven't decided yet if I want to do a pod each, after each day or just on Sunday morning after the draft wraps up, recapping the draft and all of the picks and whatever. So I haven't actually decided what I want to do there yet, but that pod will be coming out on that Sunday morning and not that Monday morning because I want to get out as soon as possible so you guys can hear my thoughts on all of Washington's draft picks. And then, of course... <coughs> Pretty much, I need some water. Uh, pretty much all of May, we'll be uh, going over kind of each player's film and pretty much breaking down every single player that Washington ends up drafting. So that'll pretty much wrap up the season. And then, of course, we'll take the break in June, come back in July for training camp and the start of a new year. So season starting to wrap up a little bit for keeping up the Commander Season 3. So yeah, only about a month and a half left. So that'll wrap up today's episode of Keeping Up With The Commanders. Um, if you enjoyed this one, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mason underscore KM. Plus, I think the YouTube channel is about to hit 500 subs. So I don't really say it a lot. I'm pretty bad at promoting it. But uh, if you want, subscribe. Um, new episodes coming out every Monday morning. Every Monday morning at 7 a.m. Eastern. So that'll do it for this week's episode of Keeping Up With The Commanders. See you guys in the next one. Peace.